Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. I see that uh, people are starting to join one by one. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day today. All right, while we wait, let me just start sharing my screen. Okay, Mercy Yoshi, can you confirm whether you can see my screen or not? Yes. Yes. Perfect. All right. So uh, let me just like wait for more people to start coming in. Let's wait for around like one minute. But in mm. the meantime, I have just sent everyone a message here in the uh, Zoom chat. You can access Gojo's quite new uh, Financial Diaries webpage. Uh, actually, let me open it while we wait. Here you can see a lot of different uh, we went through this last time in our last impact report webinar, but here you can see a lot of different um, interesting diary stories or some snapshots from the diaries itself and some reports here, which by the way, today's webinar, we will be covering this report in particular. Okay, so let me just start the webinar now uh, because it's already 6.01. Again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining today's webinar. Uh, we're really, we're we're really, really grateful to have you all here. Um, and today, I am joined by Mercy and Yoshi, who are both our researcher in residence at Gojo, who are in charge of the Gojo's Financial Diaries project. And just to introduce myself, hi everyone. My name is Rania. I'm the corporate planning officer here at Gojo, and I will be your facilitator for today. All right. So just to go through today's agenda, uh, I'll go. I'll start with an introduction to Gojo itself, and then I'll uh, hand over the um, webinar to Mercy, where she will cover about the Financial Diaries project in general. And then Yoshi will go through some key findings from the report, which will be very, very interesting. You can also access the full report, by the way, through the Financial Diaries website that's already in the Zoom chat, so be sure to visit the webpage. And then Mercy will cover the challenges faced during the um, Financial Diaries project, as well as the next steps that we plan for um, Gorgeous Financial Diaries. And lastly, uh, we also have a Q&A section. So anyone here, I think everyone here can see the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. There's a Q&A uh, logo there. Uh, anytime during the webinar, you can submit your questions, and then we'll try to address them at the end of the webinar. All right. So let me move on. All right, so just to introduce Gojo, Gojo was founded in 2014 with the vision of creating a world where everyone can determine their own future. And actually we recently, well, not quite recently now, we celebrated our 10th year anniversary back in July. And also Gojo's mission is to extend financial inclusion across the globe. And you might have known this, you might have uh, known this, but we recently, uh, entered into Africa with a minority investment in Baobab. Uh, you can also check that um, news in our press release page on the Gojo website. And yeah, our long-term goal is to eventually provide high quality, affordable financial services in 50 countries. And in terms of how Gojo operates, so our business model is to raise funds from like-minded investors, and then we channel them into new and current group companies, which are obviously aligned with Gojo's mission. Uh, we identify and invest in financial service providers mainly, which uh, serve low to medium low to medium income people in developing countries, and we eventually uh, try to take a majority stake in these companies. And at the same time, we also support our group companies to scale up and also improve their services by negotiating debt funding, improving governance processes, implementing new technologies, using data to learn about clients' outcomes and experiences, et cetera, et cetera. And as you can see here, we already have presence in a bunch of different um, areas in the world, and we will try to expand to more uh, countries and continents in the future. Okay, great. So I think, Mercy, you can take over. The stage is yours. Yeah, thank you, Rania. Greetings, everyone. I am Marcelin Manoj, uh, working as a researcher here with the Financial Diary Projects. Um, and so let's dive in with the very basic question, what is Financial Diaries? Financial Diaries is a research that enables us to understand the low-income household livelihood 
by taking a detailed look at the money management. <clears throat> there are organizations and academicians who have used and is currently using this methodology in countries like um, Bangladesh, Myanmar, US and African nations. And they had worked with uh, specific sectors like garment factory workers, small scale industries and individual respondents as well. So for us, Cambodia Financial Diaries is Gojo's one of the first diary initiatives to understand daily lives and also to understand the effectiveness of loan impact and to identify what are the indicators that helps towards outcome measurement. Next. So how do we achieve this? Through the diaries, we collect quantitative data, which is ongoing household data, and study them for insights on areas like household income, uh, overall income and expenditures, use of financial services like lending, borrowings, saving, and also to take a deeper look at what small businesses they run and how do they manage assets and so on over a period of time. Recently, someone asked me, how is financial diaries different from a regular survey? Or what more data do you have than a MIS or a CBS data? So we'll try to answer some of these questions through the presentation. So to begin with, here is an example. In the picture is one of our diaries, and the chart you see is his inflows and outflows through the research period. Now, he is the head of the household and he is a construction worker. There are six members in the household. The diary data reveals that his two sons work as a local chemical factory workers. And he also runs a small business. Yet with all these multiple income sources, you can see in the chart, his weekly household income fluctuates heavily. And there are weeks his income hits up to 400 USD. And there are many weeks his income is below 50 USD. And when we examine other significant transactions, we find he has taken two financial loans before the research period. And we get to observe how much loan repayment he makes, which institution he makes, and what is the frequency. And there is also visibility on the major inflows and outflows like um, land sales, home construction, informal loans. And we also get to see cultural aspects, region-wise social aspects as well, which has an impact in the financial behavior of this household. For example, ceremonies. There is a huge outlay on monk ceremony for which the villagers gave him a big cash gift. So the point is, Financial Diaries documents data in a systematic manner, and we are tracking real-time data, hence it is more reliable. And the strength of this approach is, it is to capture intricate details on the financial behavior and to provide insights on livelihood, seasonality, income vulnerability, and what are the coping mechanisms that we see when there are crises, and all these things. So let's move on. So next, what we see uh, is the broad uh, project structure. Firstly, we collaborated with our sponsoring agency and the local research agency to identify and onboard individuals to participate in the project. So the participants were educated in the concept and how to keep data. So then the survey design was developed and distributed by the collaborative effort of the researchers and the partners. Initially, we did a baseline survey to gather preliminary data from a very broader audience. So we worked with around 400 households. So out of these 400, uh, 149 households were selected based on their willingness to participate in the project. Then we started gathering detailed daily household data. And another important step was data analysis, uh, digitization, compiling the data, analyze the data to identify inaccuracies and to look for insights. Along with this, we also did midline survey 
after six months and inline survey after 12 months of the research program to understand change, change in household data, uh, cash flow, businesses, assets, etc. Um, apart from this, there are field visits and detailed direst interviews we did after the data collection period as well to have a better understanding of the analysis results. So let's move on. So next, to take one step deeper into the methodology, firstly, the data collection. The local enumerators recorded the household transactions either by visiting the diarist a couple of times a week or by telephonic conversation. And this was a very detailed and a frequent data exchange. Secondly, there is a data entry team that digitizes the collected data. Then we go into data cleaning and identifying details like duplicates, cash flow differences, digitization errors. Sometimes a 300 USD gets captured as 3000 USD. So the, the, the role of the data analyst is very significant. It calls for a very intentional effort to look into the cash flow of the household. And finally comes the data analysis where we look into overall statistics and use of financial services, major outlays and outcomes. Then, so this is our consolidated project view. As for the research area is concerned, it was across five provinces in Cambodia, rural and semi-rural. To have more unbiased data and better understanding of the financial behavior, Around 60% of the diaries were randomly chosen and 40% were of our group company clients. So we started with four, 149 households and on an average we had 129 during the research period. And this is one of the challenges we faced during the course of the project. Some households migrated and some gave up because of the difficulty in recording daily transactions. So there were diarist dropouts along the way and we recruited new diarist in replacement. And the duration, uh, when we think of duration, the preparation started during uh, Corona period in 2020, but we commenced the data collection in 2021, late 2021, and it went on for a year. Methodology, I, I think I previously we saw in detail. And when we look at the total number of transactions, we had collected around 220,000 records. And each household transactions were labeled into different categories like food, medical, education, business, utility, and so on. So we collaborated with a local agency called BN Consult for data collection. And then uh, moving on, according to uh, accounting for each uh, household, every day involved time, people, and resources. So it definitely involved a cost. So this research in Cambodia was made possible by JICA sponsorship. And JICA also jointly published a report with our researchers. And the data and the report is available in Gojo's website and we welcome you to read it if you're interested. So after this, we will move into our next step and we will un unpack key findings from the report based on the access to financial services. And I will hand over it to Yoshi. Okay. I am Yoshi. Um, thank you for joining our webinar today. Um, let me start my part. Um, it's about, I, I, I'm talking about the key findings from the report from the Cambodia project. So Rania, can you go to the next slide? Okay. Yes. Here, <laughs> you can see a big table summarizing the data um, collected over a uh, year. Um, from about 130 households. Uh, I, I know it's a bit packed with numbers, uh, which might seem overwhelming, uh, but you, you don't need to worry about understanding every single detail here. To cover the main points, if you look at the upper um, left section, um, you will notice that um, business income and salary make up the majority of inflows. Then in lower left section, you will see that uh, business expenses and food account for uh, a large number of, uh, large portion of outflows. On the right side of the table, 
the financial transactions are separated out here. Um, for example, a loan requires a repayment later, no? or a deposit can be withdrawn later. No? And uh, asset purchased um, may be sold in the future. Um, so we grouped these items on the right side to capture those transactions that have um, um, opposing cash flows over time. Um, financial inflow is substantial. Uh, it's over one tenth of total inflow. Loans, especially, are significant. Uh, loans from financial institutions are marked in red. Uh, these have uh, fewer entries, but a larger amount. Uh, personal loans marked in yellow um, and loans from relatives uh, marked in green uh, tend to be smaller, but more frequent and closely tied to the daily lives. Okay. So Rania, can you go to the next Yoshi, slide? Uh, before we go to the next slide, I already ah, okay. have a question. Actually, hi, everyone. Uh, let me quickly introduce myself. <laughs> Due to technical issues, I was not able to join from the beginning. Apologies. <laughs> uh, my name is Haruna from Gojo's corporate planning team. Uh, thank you, Rania, for covering up my part. Uh, very well done. Um, so for this section, uh, let me chime in from time to time uh, to make it more interactive and interesting. Uh, mm. Thank you for already posting some questions in the Q&A, but uh, mm. I encourage you also, you know, share questions uh, using the Q&A function. Now, Yoshi, I have a very simple question. Uh, okay. It looks like income is less than expenditure uh, in general, yeah. and also financial <laughs> inflow is less compared to financial uh, inflow, which is yeah. a bit confusing can you maybe explain why this yeah is the case? um yeah um and we need to accept the fact actually so sometimes tires wants to hide especially income side and as long as i know um the some similar project also some other researchers uh, i think observe the similar i think behavior from diarists um of course we tried to capture 100 percent everything and if you capture everything, um, these uh, the, the total number of inflows and outflows needs to be a little bit more closer. Um, but um, this is what we we tried our best. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I, I, I understand. Uh, I think it's also worth mentioning that the, typically, you know, when we continue doing this research, the accuracy keeps improving. So at the beginning, yes. it's kind of less accurate, but the yes. more diarists get used to this, uh, the more accurate it gets. So I think right. it's worth noting uh, for the audience that, you know, right. of course, the data is not perfect. We try and accuracy improves over time. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right that uh, to, I don't know, for example, to summarize our report, um, probably I think uh, simply um, don't use for three months, I think is one way for us to, 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 I don't know, have a slightly more accurate, I don't know, summary table. But since we have um, a couple of very interesting transactions in early days, and in this report, we, we decided to pick up everything. That's what we did. I see, I see. Makes sense. Yeah. Sorry okay. for stopping. Let's go into the interesting Okay, let's details. go to the next one. <laughs> okay. Here I have created a bar chart uh, of these loans um, sorted by size, showing those from financial institutions or relatives or private lenders. But the, the large size of loans from financial institutions make the bars for uh, loans from relatives or private lenders up, appear shorter and less visible. So um, the next in the next slide, I tried using a log scale on the vertical axis here. Um, don't worry, math isn't my, my strong suit either. Um, you can see uh, by the axis levels um, in the, on the left side, uh, it starts at ten dollars, and then one hundred dollars, and then one thousand dollars, and then ten thousand um, dollars in increments of ten folds. And loans from microfinance institutions often are deferred to to as uh, financial inclusion are uh, relatively large. Um, typically from uh, a few hundreds to several thousand dollars. Um, though they are not um, many, they are not numerals. Meanwhile, 
people often borrow from relatives or private lenders for small amounts, usually under a, a few hundred dollars. So this kind of borrowing was existed long before microfinance institutions emerged. And today we are going to focus on the, these loans in lead, the ones from financial institutions. So the next one, yes. So during the one year study period, we observed a total of 19 one nine loans from financial institutions among around 130 diarists. Um, it's commonly called uh, the financial inclusion loans. Um, but among those, uh, two of these were taken by family members uh, rather than our uh, direct respondent and the details are not available for them. And among those uh, loans, one household, which the direct number is 135, took three loans, and another household, 149, took two loans. So the total number of borrowing households was 14, 14. Now on to the main question for today. Did access to microfinance loans increase household income or not? Using financial diaries data, which captures uh, real life transactions closely, we analyzed uh, income changes for each loan. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. The blue lines represent the income level of diarists who took loans from financial institutions. The timing, the disbursement timing of the loan is marked by the vertical axis. So income before the loan is on the left side of the axis and income after the loan is on the right side. Mm -hmm. I, have I have included the graphs for all 17 loans across two pages. So Rania, it's great if you flip between those uh, two slides. Oh. Okay. This is quite <laughs> shocking, Yoshino. <laughs> yes. No increase. Uh, no, this is the question. So can you see any, any I don't know, income increase after the, the loans were taken? Um, um, yeah, probably some, uh, but uh, the, the, how can I say? So to be honest, uh, it's not um, very evident that uh, loans contributed to the the, the the trend of increased income um, at least for me it's it's not evident mm, the only thing we can say from these charts are it's highly volatile right uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> up and down yes so then maybe uh, Rani, if you can go back to the slide back yeah this one the one on the left hand side the one in the middle looks uh, like it's increasing but then the period is very short so oh, okay. again it can just be kind of, you know, a part of fluctuation. We don't right. see really a long-term right. trend. Right. I will talk about this later. Hmm. Thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but it's um, kind of shocking because, you know, the microfinance narrative usually goes that you, if you take an MFI loan, it's used for income generation and therefore your income should increase. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. The data doesn't really show that. Mm. Exactly. Okay. So why don't we see income rising? This is the, the today's point. So by examining each loan and household transaction in detail, today we aim to uncover the underlying reasons. So what was the actual use of funds from these loans? So financial dice let us track this easily. In five out of 14, five household loans were used for home construction as shown in the next slide. Okay. Um, here is a timeline graph of all transactions from diarist um, 190, The top section upper part represent inflows to the household and the bottom part represent outflow. And time flows from left to the right. In April, 2022, they took a large loan shown as a big red bar and used it to purchase construction material the next day, marked by the large blue bar. 
So these transactions were major event, event uh, compared to the usual transactions. Okay, home construction can potentially, potentially lead to a better living or working environment, no? which might positively, in, might positively impact income. But um, however, um, it's less likely to increase income directly or, or immediately. Okay, and Rania, you, in this case, you can slowly skipping next four slides. These four households also used funds for home construction. Um, since we are short on time today, I won't go into the details of those, those, those households, but I encourage you to read the, the published paper. I think it's uh, full of uh, interesting details. Okay. And probably, yes, this slide. And the next category, so in two households, funds were used for business investment. Uh, this is a classic example of how microfinance institutions intend their loans to be used. Okay, and yes, so this is the one, Haruna. And in this household, funds were used to buy farm, it's agri, agriculture equipment. It's, it's a big machine, actually. Um, but un un unfortunately, this household, uh, as Marcy already explained, this household later dropped out of the financial advice program. Um, and it's, it's common for participants to find that these are, uh, I don't know, very frequent reporting, uh, sometimes a burdensome and leading to dropout. And uh, I think, Harna, you're right. It, it looks like uh, the income, okay, uh, the previous slide, yes. Yeah. If you look at the right side, upper part, the small income line chart. Yeah. No, the, the, you'll see this is, I think, negligible. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> Since it's an agri machine, probably I think they, they this was the timing to use agri machine. So probably, yeah, the the causal relationship is not that clear. Um, it, machine create the income increase, or simply they they need to the machine to make their agri business. I, right. I it's a shame that this person dropped. Uh, if we had tracked the data from, you know, mm. a bit more in the past and also in, in future, maybe we could have seen because of this harvester, maybe mm. their seasonal income might right. have increased. But we need to right. track at least two or three years, I guess, right. uh, to right. see that trend. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> although, you know, the right hand top graph looks looks like it's in income increase. I think it's difficult yeah. for us to conclude that right. this harvester contributed to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Anyway, um, they dropped out. It's a, it's a, it's a oh, shame. Oh, it's a shame. Yeah. Okay. yeah, it's a shame. But it's a very typical case, right? This is what MFIs yes. typically assume when we yes, yes. This is a, a classic case. Okay. 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 I see. And uh, skipping the next slide, yes. In two other households, uh, this is shocking. Loan funds were used for ceremonies, specifically for weddings. Okay. Let's let's look closer. Okay, so these households transactions were a bit, a bit complex, complicated. They held a wedding for their daughter in April 2022, and the two large bluebirds show the wedding related uh, the expenses. A few weeks later, the, a few, I don't know, two, three, um, the right side bars, if you look at the bars, they took a loan from microfinance institutions to cover some of those costs to get. And to get this loan, they repaid an existing loan. And in addition, several months later, if you look at the slightly right side, um, they switched to a different MFI loan and they bought a, a, a boat at the same time, showing, uh, 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 how can I say, some creative maneuvering. So weddings are major life events and making these happy occasions possible may be considered a, a life priority rather than, I don't know, in, increasing income. So personally, I feel that the calling this uh, I, like a consumption or undesirable spending, um, I think it, it's, it's oversimplified the story. 
after all of what what's more important than than celebrating happy moments in life no? so um yeah these are a little bit complicated example and mm. yes makes me think what is impact yeah is it just about income or this uh, right. happy moment uh if right. mfis contribute to creating right. a very memorable moment in life is yes. that impact maybe yeah so exactly very interesting exactly. example yeah. Mm -mm. Yeah. And I will skip the next wedding. Yes, the, the last one. Now I must say this others category here with the remaining five household is quite fascinating, probably for you. Um, but since we are short on time today, um, please check the published report for all the details. I, I just I just give you a, a taste. Okay. Can we talk about the next one? This one. This is my favorite yes, yes. person. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, of course. This household took out one just oh, okay, one three five, took up multiple loans, actually three loans from MFIs to speculate on trading cars and motorcycles. Okay, so chutters, yeah, probably I think I would I would add that a little bit more car. So over a period of about six months, it's just six months. The household took out an exceptional number of loans, three loans from different microfinance institutions and la one large private loan. The microfinance model often encourages loans for purchasing assets like cars or motorcycles, you know, uh, which can generate income. But, um, but this level of active uh, speculative trading is, is some, I think it's somewhat outside the norm. So they bought cars and sold a motorcycle and then bought another motorcycle and a trade motorcycle for yet another one and sold and re-bought cars and sold cars again and then mm. resold the motorcycles. It's countless <laughs> transactions that yeah, this, I believe did generate generated income mm -hmm. but um probably we cannot call this a classic example but anyway let's go to the next one uh, this person is very clever no like I, he uses mfi loans to just yeah. do very fast trading of right. asset a yeah. very financially savvy i feel right right and, and definitely i think car market or motorcycle market need him um, yeah, to to probably. to create a liquidity there, but um, I don't know if we we can, but but definitely this can be a, a kind of exception. No? Mm, okay, very right. interesting. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so this this is also interesting. Uh, this one also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. The, 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 a husband bought a nice set of speakers or on, on, on impulse. <laughs> So if you look at the vertical axis and the height of the birth, so uh, definitely this household is among the poorest in uh, our diary sample. And one day when uh, this uh, speaker salesperson visited their village with a sample, I, the, the young husband was immediately cap captivated by it. And he called his boss right away. Hey boss, <laughs> can you lend me some money today? Um, to buy this and then and a few months later he refinanced with a loan from an mfi and uh, uh, um yeah this is actually the typical consumption but i had a chance to visit him for mm -hmm. an interview and he was like all smiles and, and it, it was clear uh, that uh, his wife or his mother and he, his kids were happy with uh, uh, his way of living Oh, okay. um, so, so it looked like a, a super happy family. So oh. personally, I think uh, there's an impact in this uh, in its own way, but I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I were his wife, I would be quite angry that he bu he buys a speaker without. Right. Thinking. Actually, the, the <laughs> wife told me that uh, when he bought a speaker on this day, that she was uh, like uh, angry. <laughs> 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 It's funny, but uh, yeah, but she told me, I don't know, the, the story funny. Anyway, mm -hmm. so yeah, let's go to the next one. We have, we have limited time today. Okay, so this household bought a precious metals um, instead of uh, depositing funds to be prepared uh, just in case. So it's not just the Cambodian diarist in pro this project. Um, 
in rural area in developing countries often experience similar conditions. So many of these households are a long walk, um, sometimes an hour from the nearest bank branch or ATM. And additionally, probably the historical factor have left uh, many people with uh, uh, less trust in banks than, than we might have in developed country or in Japan. Um, and also the rising uh, price of gold over the past uh, couple of decades also, I think, uh, the played a part. And as a result, it's not uncommon to see people buy gold or jewelry almost as if they are making a deposit. And this household had also brought gold with the farming level at the end of the previous year, indicating uh, their preference for, 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 for this methodology. Mm. Okay. And let's go to the next. We need to be quick. Okay. Um, so for this one, um, yeah, we even took out a loan uh, just because the loan officer was uh, particularly uh, persuasive. Um, so for, so dives number 436, I actually had the opportunity to visit this household at the end of the last year. I was particularly interested in meeting them because they are one of the few households that seems to be experience, experiencing increased income after taking out a loan. Um, after the interview, I felt both a kind of not, you know, disappointed and also uh, interested because uh, the family described themselves as uh, good clients for the MFI, good mm -hmm. clients. And they didn't really remember what they had bought exactly with their own funds oh. shown on the graph. So this is, I believe, also a, a reality of microfinance. Um, Do you think they needed the loan, Yoshi? Uh, I, I asked the same question. And, but they recognize themselves as a good client. And that means like a loan officer wanted them to borrow money, and they did. Mm, okay. Not pushed strongly, probably, but uh, I don't know. They just uh, wanted to keep a good relationship with uh, MFI. I, I that's see. my that's my guess. Um, yeah. and also I asked about the reason why their income was increasing at that time. Um. And they simply replied to me that, oh, back or oh, sad, back then the economy was good. Uh, <laughs> the macroeconomy was good. And I, I, I couldn't help but uh, laugh a little. But anyway, now let's go to the last one. Um, so this household took an emergency loan after suddenly contracting COVID-19. I found this to be particularly impactful example of a well-designed loan program. The program used a local agent from the village to offer a small quick loans, enabling them to seek prompt medical treatment. So recovering from illness sooner means the household income can bounce back sooner no? compared to to, to if the illness had uh, linger longer, last longer. In, in that sense, I think we could even say it's a type of, of a kind of income generating investment. But anyway, yes. So um, lastly, as the as last part of my, my part, uh, I'd, I'd like to briefly suggest a few ideas before concluding. In the most com common case, home, home construction, we found that project funds were often used incrementally. So first buying construction materials, then hiring workers, carpenters, and then you go to the next part, buying materials again and trying to find the workers again and so on. So households often had to store significant loan balances at home between stages of the project. If loans could be disbursed incrementally, it might reduce this burden. Um, so this is one suggestion we make in the paper. And next one, in case of weddings, the timing of the loan disbursement didn't align perfectly with the wedding date. 
So usually wedding dates are set uh, well in advance. No? So we suggest a loan product allowing borrowers to select a disbursement date and probably combined with an early application um, requirement for, for, for processing, loan processing time, probably. Okay, so that concludes my part. Um, thank you very much. Um, and I will pass the, the, the button to Marcy again. Thank you, Yoshi. Um, before we move on to the last part, maybe Rania, hmm. if you have time, you can also share the fit factor uh, paper on chat because what Yoshi was talking about in conclusion is exactly what is written in the fit factor, uh, where we basically, you know, time the long, like the inflow and the out outflow uh, timing so that it's more convenient for the client. Uh, Great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Right. I will actually share later. Thank you. Great. I, I want to talk much more about each of these examples. I also wanted to highlight this medical case that you mm. had at the end. Uh, I think it's a very good example of how MFI loans can be used in emergency cases for medical right. treatment. I think it's also a good thing to highlight. Right. Anyway, sorry, uh, Mercy, I'll pass it on to you. You can wrap up this uh, session uh, with the challenges and the next steps. OK, yes. Thank you, Haruna and Yoshi. Yeah, so here are our key takeaways, first of all, from the, from the project. So we see a strong MFI presence in the household money management. When we look at the total financial outflows, loan repayment is the topmost category in terms of frequency and amount. And when we look at the overall household expenditure, 10% of the outflow is of loan repayments. And we also see around 72% of the diarists have engaged in loan repayments throughout the research period. And then about the use of funds, the funds have gone into construction, business uh, investment, asset purchase ceremonies. We also observe in certain cases that the, the loan amount is split, is split and it is used for multiple purposes. For example, a female borrower taking a loan, she uses a chunk for her small business. And then the remaining amount is being passed on to the family member, for example, her spouse's business. So in such a case, though we can consider indirectly, it helps in the overall uh, business income of the household, yet there are times the wife is not fully aware where the remaining funds are used. Hence, differentiating the loan product based on the purpose for which they are used for helps us to also understand what outcome is really achieved through the loans. And then um, it is not explicitly observed that MFI loans directly generate income. So we uh, touched upon this point, so I'll move on. More frequent and smaller loans from relatives and money lenders. What we see is there is a cluster around few hundred USDs for the informal loans. And it also reveals flexibility and ease of access but when we look at the formal loans, it ranges from 1,000 USD to about 10,000 USD. And when we look at the frequency of the informal loans, 81% were small-sized informal loans. And then to touch upon the proportion and the usage of funds, in for some of the households, the loan size were very high. And in certain cases, there is only a small proportion of the funds are being used and the remaining amount is either kept as cash in hand or as a saving for emergency or used to repay other existing loans. So to summarize um, with the households we researched on, examining the effectiveness of microfinance loans and the indicators on the outcome measurement, we observe that the improvement in living conditions, uh, business continuity, asset management or asset building healthcare, and also social capital like ceremonies and other uh, significant events all contribute to the outcome and the overall well-being of the households. So let's move next. So finally, before we close, we're almost time. I'll quickly touch upon this. Uh, when we worked in Cambodia and Sri Lanka Financial Diary. So these are some of the common uh, challenges that we face. So there are layers of challenges in phases like data collection, digitization, analysis, both at the data processing end and at the diarist end. 
The first and foremost is the data accuracy and privacy. Diaries forget to record all transactions. Diaries may not be entirely truthful and also hesitant to share financial information. So there is a level of trust that is required to be developed over time to have better data quality. And then comes communication between diarists, enumerators, data analysis team, uh, the data entry team to gather better data. And then digitization errors, I shared this before, uh, inflow can get captured as an outflow, vice versa. So regular checks are essential. Diarist dropouts. Mm. If the diarist do not see the benefit of financial literacy, if they are not uh, see the benefit of awareness towards their own money, they can lose interest in recording everyday data over a period of time because it is a detailed transactional data. And also we see migrational issues. So the other points I will just touch upon, hospitalization, uh, travel, death, migration, separating uh, financial transactions. These are some of the common challenges that we faced uh, during the process. And also um, regarding our next steps, and these are some things that we are exploring on, to look into how diaries cope up with multiple loans and loan repayment burdens. We are planning to look into individual households and to write about that. We are also thinking of um, looking into diaries, uh, combination of how diaries cope up with lo uh, loans and savings, and also difference in quality of life between those who use the financial services and those who do not. These are some of the things we are uh, we are intending to touch upon. So with this, we are almost time. I finish here and thank you very much for joining us. We can move into the next segment on Q&A. Okay, thank you so much, uh, both Yoshi and Mercy. Now let's go into the Q&A. We have a bit more than 10 minutes. Thank you already for uh, contributing a lot of interesting questions. Uh, let me start by taking up Fanny's question. Uh, thank you so much for the questions. I think, Mercy, you can take both of Fanny's questions. The first one is, okay, uh, do end beneficiaries track their cash flows on a mobile applications or on sheets? Now we have two financial diaries, maybe Mercy, you can explain this. And uh, together with that, uh, she's also asking, are they willing to take part in this survey? Are there any incentives to the participant? So maybe if you can answer these two questions for Fanny, that would be great. Okay, thank you, sure. Thank you, Fanny, for asking these questions. Um, yeah, and this is a methodology question. So apart from uh, Cambodia, we worked on um, Sri Lanka financial diaries also, as well. So the literacy rate of the people plays an important role in our data collection. Uh, for in Cambodia, we, what we did it is we had to go meet with the person where they record, where they tell the enumerators and they write it down. It is maintained in sheets, as you asked. Um, so we had to go through this process of meeting the diarist or taking a phone call with them. But when it comes to Sri Lanka financial diaries, we do see the literacy rate of the Sri Lanka people had been much better. So what we did was we distributed our diarist notebooks with them and they self-recorded their daily transactions. So we, we do see a much level of granularity and a detailed uh, transactional uh, recording when it comes to uh, Sri Lanka financial diaries. That is to answer your first question. And the second question was on um, about, yeah, how willing are they to take part in the survey? Are there any incentives to participate? Yes, of course, there are incentives. We gave uh, the diarist a monthly uh, support. Um, so, and uh, a JICA, I have to mention definitely the JICA from uh, Japan was one of our sponsors. Uh, they played an important role in throughout the design and data collection and also in the final analysis part. And yes, when we finished uh, our uh, financial diaries in Sri Lanka, especially, we got uh, reports from so many diarists that do not stop this project. We would like to continue the project. And even one of the ladies wrote to us saying, so the meaningful way she ends the day is by recording, self-recording her financial transactions over the day. So we got very positive feedbacks uh, using this financial diaries from the diaries. Thank you for the question. 
Okay, thank you, Merci. Uh, now we also have a few questions from Stuart, which uh, I want Yoshi to take. Uh, so let me read out the questions for everyone. Uh, what are the prospects of this work influencing the work of Kojo's MFI partners and in what way is the first question. Um, Yoshi, do you want to try answering this? <laughs> It's a very difficult question. It's a very tough question. So <laughs> exactly. I, I, I need to ask you. So yeah, definitely we need to start this. No? So how do you think of Haruna? Of me? OK. Yeah. All right. Uh, my view is, OK. So what, what we learned from this paper is that the impact is very wide, right? Uh, we should not be naive and just think that, you know, oh, we should assume income increase uh, whenever we provide an MFI loan, which I think is actually also understood by our partner companies. So Gojo's MFI group companies typically understand that there's a lot of, you know, varieties in terms of loan utilization, which is good. And I think by sharing this result, it can lead to some, you know, new product development. Uh, for example, I know that Sejaya, uh, one of our group companies is now considering gold loan, uh, which, you know, is a loan taken to create like uh, asset accumulation uh, using gold. So that that is, I think, one additional kind of loan use case uh, that can be created, not necessarily maybe from this financial diary, but uh, I'm assuming, you know, such application of this study uh, to basically result in some sort of product development. That's number one. Um, otherwise, I don't know, Yoshi, maybe you might have come yeah. up with some ideas while I answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For the first one, from my point of view, as I told uh, I, in the in the last example of the the, the others, um, so a small quick loan in the the uh, Cambodian household, I think, was uh, was uh, at least from other our examples, it, it looks very useful, very impactful, and this can be, I think, a, a I don't know the source of or food for the the discussions about the product development. Um, that's uh, one thing. And uh, for the second question is much easier for me. So what did the participant tell you about whether they found participating in a project useful? Um, so by interviewing them, so most of them told like they had uh, op opportunity to talk about their money among their, their household members, family members. Um, typically in dinner time, and that was uh, the people told me that they, they are happy with it. Okay, thank you, Yoshi. Mm. Mercy, do you also want to comment about Stuart's first question? Yeah, definitely. Mm. See, uh, as, see, Gojo is, is a budding initiative of working with financial diaries for the last three plus years or so. So we also see that our understanding about income, uh, impact, and outcome has also evolved over time. And we also see uh, through these uh, financial diaries how households have multiple income sources, so which could be used, which could be communicated uh, with the group companies on, on what are the in different income sources they have. So it gives visibility on their cash flow analysis, loan assessments, and we also see the effectiveness of impact. Recently, um, we are uh, revising our impact revision framework. So we are looking into various uh, indicators or KPIs, like what is the real impact of microfinance loans? So that is another thing that, that we are um, encountering as we are looking into different data. And also to see the effectiveness of loans um, as such, if this is helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mercy. I'm also always wondering, like, you know, can we apply this fit factor concept to the group companies? Because MFI is to make operation easier. It's very typical that it's very, you know, timed in a very rigid way. But can we make that more flexible is, I think, one homework uh, that we have to keep working on, Stuart. Uh, I don't have an answer yet, but uh, I think it's another thing that we might want to pursue in future. All right. Uh, so I think, I hope I answered Stuart's questions. Uh, I think there's another question from uh, Yoneji-san. Uh, what kind of contracts does Gojo have with the users and do they conduct court proceedings in the event of default? 
Now, um, let me answer this question quickly, and Mercy, you should feel free to chime in. Uh, I, I'm assuming uh, that this question talks about a contract between the diarist and Gojo. So typically, uh, we have this consent form that we provide to the diarists, uh, where they we explain, you know, how the data is collected, how it is stored, how it is managed, and whether they're okay with it. Uh, and the diarist will sign uh, if they're happy with that. So that's the contract between Gojo and the diarist. Now, the latter part of the question, I'm assuming you're talking about uh, an MFI borrower. Uh, if they default, so you know the payment is delayed, uh, do we go into court proceedings? Sometimes, yes, uh, but there's steps before that. Uh, typically, what happens is loan officer will visit delinquent clients and ask, you know, why are they delinquent? Is there intention to repay? Uh, is there anything that we can do to support them to kind of manage their situation so that they can start repaying. Uh, so that is done. In some cases, uh, we also consider restructuring of the loan uh, to basically extend the repayment timeline or make the repayment amount smaller uh, every month so that it's easier for them to manage. But you know, if all of this does not work out, then there is no intention for the client to repay the loan. Sometimes, yes, uh, MFIs can go into this court proceedings, but it is very rare because uh, taking this to court will cost a lot of money. And uh, usually, you know, it's not really worth doing uh, that. Uh, we just kind of give up the loan and uh, write off is, I think, what typically MFIs do. Uh, details of this is actually in our latest impact report, which, Rania, I, I hope you can share uh, with the group. Uh, I hope you can read that and uh, have a better understanding. Let me add uh, a small point. Yeah. So the 19 um, microfinance laws we observed, uh, some of them are from our Gojo's group companies, but uh, the, most of them, I think, is, uh, is, is uh, different from Gojo's group companies. So we don't know, basically, about these uh, other microfinance laws. But I believe, I think, the process can be very similar to what Haruna explained right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, okay. I think we have one more question that just came in. I have two questions. The first question is: I think Cambodia uses both uses both real and USD in everyday currency. Yes. Are there any characteristics in the financial diary that might change depending on which currency people have? And the second question is, is this survey targeted at people from a specific region or does it include users from various regions? Um, Yoshi, Mercy, which of you want to take the question? Yeah, um, yes. Yes, they, they use both the real and US data. Typically, if the, the, the transaction size is large, probably sometimes they use US data. The small daily transactions are mostly done by real. And uh, they are much depending that they moved. Um, what is, yeah, yeah that, that's the answer. That, and the second one is, is this survey target is specific? Yeah, we did the survey in five regions in Cambodia. Um, it's more uh, specifically. Yeah, but um, honestly speaking, the difference, difference between those five areas are not, at least for me, not that big. So probably I think the 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 um the rural area poor people's life um it's a kind of similar um each other um it's not depending on the place or area that's my view. Masi, do you have anything to add? Yeah, Yoshi, I think you covered. Just one point I would add is the work area. I mean the sector they work with. So, you know, in both Cambodia and Sri Lanka, we saw uh, when we worked with different regions. Sometimes we work with construction workers. Sometimes we are working with fishermen. So when we see that commune of people, so there is that difference. Sometimes we work with tea plantation workers, agricultural workers. So that's the main difference. The sector difference is definitely there. Okay, thank you so much. I think uh, we need to now wrap up. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining. Uh, 
and also being very interactive, sharing a lot of questions. I hope you enjoyed the webinar. Again, you know, please read the full report. Uh, we just recently published it. And uh, if there's any comments, feedback, uh, please uh, contact us at pr at gojo.co. And also after this, after, when you close this webinar, Rania, right, uh, you will get a survey form. Uh, so we appreciate if you can answer the survey quickly. It just takes two or three minutes uh, so that we can improve further in future. So yeah, thank you for joining at dinner time for those in Japan and uh, for those joining globally. I don't know where you are, but uh, thank you so much for joining and uh, see you soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. See you. Bye bye.